seminars. This is the first seminar out of three seminars that we are going to be hosting during the next two, three weeks on different aspects regarding mobility. All of this started with the moment when we um, translated the Atlas on Mobility in Europe and we thought that it was very important to to travel in Europe, but also the conditions of mobility within Europe are very different and we wanted to focus on, on Spain. That is why we have decided to create different info sheets and information with regards to mobility here in Spain. And our colleague Raúl from Transición Verde, Fundación Transición Verde, is going to talk to us about different aspects and then we will talk about aviation. And we have Sergio Alegre from the European Organization of Cities, which have an airport, which have airports in their geography. And then we will also have Joan Herrera from El Prat, the airport El Prat, who will explain the situation at El Prat with the idea of increasing the space of the airport with everything that it entails. But before we give the floor to Raúl, there is an anecdote I wanted to share with you because now that we have the mobility days, I wanted to live this mobility in Europe um, actually in a, as a protagonist because I've actually taken three different uh, means of transportation, a plane, a train and a bus a coach so that we, I could get to the place I find myself in right now and I have to say that the only means of transportation that was a one-off that is not usually something I do is plane because the rest was actually a miracle for me to actually reach any place with train and bus. In countries such as Spain and Germany, in both places, is something that we need to dig deeper and we need a long debate, an intense debate on this. How can we really develop a better sustainable mobility that will give us the option of moving around but also respecting the environment? So today we start with aviation. And I will be giving the floor to my colleague from the Foundation Transición Verde, Raúl Gómez, so that he can explain to us how the um, atlas came about. This atlas that um, uh, Heinrich Boll did, um, that I've already talked about. Thank you so much, Susanne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to the Green European Foundation and to the Foundation um, uh, sound, uh, because as uh, Susanne has said, we are going to talk about aviation. We want to also present to you the European Atlas of Mobility. This atlas was created by the German, the German foundation um, Heinrich, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, and this is something that they started doing in 2013. Uh, these are uh, atlases and actually atlas is already a word that is self-explanatory. We try to tackle in a complete way from many different perspectives matters that are uh, fundamental for the environment and for the future of our societies. Up till now they did the atlas of meat, uh, the atlas of, car of coal or carbon, of soil, lots of different things. They're all available in their website in German and in English. And uh, we have actually translated uh, many of them into Spanish. And what we are presenting here today is the Spanish version of the Mobility Atlas. And the previous one that we also translated was the Insects Atlas. These are topics, as I said, that are fundamental for the future of our planet and they are considered in a very large way, very holistic way. And this European Atlas on Mobility, the Spanish version, has been translated by the Green European Foundation. And we talk about the um, transport in Europe since its origins until today. It actually, no, no Horizons also was in charge of the translation. And 
We have to say that we used to be an innovative center with regards to technologies and means of transportation, and the means of transportation have been basic for the development of our cities. Obviously, the easy way in which we could move either freight or people was fundamental in order to configure the society we live in. More specifically for the European Union, it has really helped for the cohesion of the European Union, a, here, a European Union without frontiers, such as that one that we currently have. But this ease of movement that we have been enjoying obviously comes at a price, and that price is for transport in Europe to be almost represent almost 30% of our CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. And these are data that are reflected on the Atlas. And I don't think it's necessary for us to talk about climate change because it is obvious that we have to reduce our emissions. So since that is what currently mobility is facing and what Europe is facing, what it tries to analyze is how to reduce those emissions without it being... Um, being translated into a loss of employment. We have to try and match the need for your job creation and a future low on emissions. So the challenge that transportation faces is huge because we're not just talking about electrification, we're talking about new fuels, digitization, automatization. So obviously it is a change in paradigm almost, I'd say. It's a key moment, it's a tipping point. It's a milestone in in the transportation sector in Europe. And obviously we cannot forget about employment and that's due to obvious reasons. But just to give you some figures, transport in Europe represents 13.8 million jobs. Those are the jobs that are linked to the transportation sector. And it is it represents 7% of the GDP, what, um, what is produced in the EU, EU that comes from transportation. So we have to reduce our emissions while we maintain our jobs and while we um, strive to improve our future. So in the Atlas, we see clearly that this is a multi-layered effort. It has to be a national, international, municipal, regional effort, but all of it within a global framework, which in our case is the EU. We are obviously linked um, by geography and laws with a whole series of geographies that will have an impact on our decisions. That is why the Atlas needed to be European. And this EU that currently is betting for a green pact, a new green deal, European green deal that wants to reach uh, climate neutrality also needs to include transportation and review the regulations for transportation in, in Europe. And obviously that has also been said in the Atlas, what the possibilities are following that thread, that line. And these changes will also obviously require modifications in infrastructures and that, re that means financing. Sometimes they say that the real political will can be seen in financing. If we want to change something, if it doesn't have its own budget, then it is only empty words. And beside the pluriannual uh, budget that goes from 2021 till 2027, we currently have set up uh, well, actually, in Spain, we are the first country, I believe, to have already presented some concrete projects. We have the Next Generation Funds. Much of that, of those funds, I'm sure you all know about this, but I'm going to say it quickly. These are funds that supposedly are to be used for an energy transition and a digital transition in Europe. And they are a very important inflow of money. It's 70 billion euros in Spain and then 70 billion in loans. So part of this transformation, as I said previously, you understand the importance of emissions has to go through this, through transportation. And we have to bet for a transportation model that is much more sustainable. In Europe, it's true that something is changing. Until the 80s, um, transportation was completely excluded from policies, from European policies. But in 1983, we started 
considering this topic as something serious that needed to be taken seriously and we started making progress but since we started so late there is a lack of coordination uh, basic things such as the um, width of rails in in trains that is not compatible in all countries even within countries uh, high speed trains and conventional trains don't have the same the same width in their rails and obviously we also need to have a uh, cross-border European network. We have to develop a series of initiatives that in this European Atlas on Mobility are highlighted. Also, the Atlas contains, obviously, um, an analysis of the best practices that can be exported or that need to be studied in depth. I don't want to feed you too much information because in your registration um in your registration form you had a link to the atlas so when the days are over we will send you an email once again with the link so that you can visit the atlas but i wanted to say that beside this spanish version of this european atlas as Susanne has already said we wanted to do something more we wanted to land it to spain and mobility in spain so Transición Verde has decided to work with the Green European Foundation and Henrik Boyle and Nose Horizons and the Sustainability Observatory so that we could create an annex for the Atlas on the situation in Spain, which will be available online and will be completely uh, free. And we have updated the data regarding mobility in Spain. We have obviously considered all the different sectors, all the different transportation modes, aviation, um, railways, maritime transportation, and we wanted to land it or, or really uh, put it within context. What really worries us on the day-to-day, -day, what citizens need when they're going to travel, when they're going to move around. And something I didn't want to forget was the fact that the Atlas contains uh, a few thoughts about what the COVID pandemic has meant to it, how the patterns have been modified, how how mobility has changed, how it has paralyzed many infrastructures. For instance, the aviation sector has complete, has been radically changed. And also this moment, this change in paradigm required for will actually um, allow us to see things differently. So as I said, we will be sending the links um, again so that you can take a look at these documents. And now I don't want to take more time from um, our colleagues or um, my co-speakers who are going to talk about aviation specifically, which is the topic that we're going to be dealing with during this session. So thank you so much. And you have, if you have any doubts, you can always write them down on the chat. And when the presentations are done, we will try and answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raul. So we will start with um, planes and aviation. And for that to happen, we have two specialists here, one in the field and another one in this specific topic. So I will give the floor to Sergi so that he may continue with his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Susanne, and thank you so much, Raul, and thank you so much uh, to the Green European Foundations. Uh, thank you so much to No Horizons and Transición Verde for allowing me to be here today with you and to share a few ideas, a few informations with regards to that simple thing, which is aviation. Obviously, I'm, I'm joking, it's not simple in Europe. So due to my personal condition and my family condition, my, my surname, I'm always optimistic. So because his name is Alegre, which means joyful in Spanish. So in general, I think that we can see um, because you see that in the pandemic we have had some peak moments and then some moments when the uh, figures went down. Well, I think that aviation in Europe, and I repeat, in Europe, I think that the peak moment has already gone by. And I think that in general there is a trend, and I will try and share with you my arguments, the whys of my reasoning, what takes me to drawing this conclusion and this these ideas. So in Europe, we are seeing a sort of confluence of factors that I believe need to make us think that we 
are making progress so that aviation finds its natural place and occupies its uh, natural place with regards to transportation means. I think that aviation is making progress in Europe and it is taking the place it should take, which is that of, of long, long travels. So that's the specter in mobility. I think that the uh, intercontinental uh, transfers on long hauls, that is what we need to use planes for, because I think that we have, maybe in 200 years, they will laugh at us. But if we look at what happened 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, we have really advanced thanks to planes. And that is a natural spot for planes, long hauls. Sometimes when we talk in Brussels, because I work in Brussels, as Raul said, I am the general director, or Susanne said, I am the general director of a European association of cities and regions that have, te that have airports in their territory. It's been 18 years. When we talk to stakeholders of this sector, obviously it's usually airlines and airports when you tell them, well, this is where we're headed. Sometimes they laugh at us and they say no. Sometimes they say no because they don't like it and others because they don't see it. But I always give them the same example. When my father purchased his first car in 1975, um, last century, last millennia, someone would uh, have told him there will be a time where when you cannot drive your car at the speed you want in any city, in any street in your city, he would have laughed as well. But that's what's happening now, isn't it? And with much effort and with uh, progress and steps backwards, obviously, and with and there are places where the speed is higher and others it's it's lower. Well, in all of Europe, we see that this is being applied. Cars are uh, going to be in their place and are. I mean, I know that during the expansion, the car was in a place that wasn't its natural place. Well, with aviation, we see that there is a parallel evolu evolution. At the beginning, it was only for rich people. Then there was an explosion in its use. And then there's a moment when, luckily enough, because people um, have proposed, have been proposing this for many years. Well, in general, we reach a moment when we understand that we have to, to kind of of stop, we need to use our brains when using this tool because it's actually a tool, a tool um, such as a plane or a car, those are tools. And we have to use it in the best way for the whole of society. So what are the elements um, in Europe? Obviously there are differences, but in Europe, I think that first of all, there's politics. Politics pushed by awareness, social awareness, but politics, I mean, the step taken by France Obviously, there are exceptions and we could make as many comments as we want. And now there aren't any flights of less than 500 kilometers if there is a train alternative. For those of you who are within politics or close to politics, you know that that is a very important step, especially because they were the first to take it. And because it wasn't a small country either. It wasn't a country that didn't have an important weight within the EU. I mean, France is important in that sense. So that step, logically, and I think that people who are within the world of politics or close to green parties, the European Greens, we have to push so that this debate takes place. That needs to be the next step for all three big countries in Europe. So that would be, the other three big countries would be, obviously, Germany, the new government, the Green Party, which is in the um, government, has it in its, in its program, in its political program, then Italy and Spain due to their size. Those are the three big geographical countries that I think will have to take that step. And they have all the elements for that step to be taken. Then there's Sweden and Norway, although that, you know that Norway is not completely present in EU, but they have uh, their own orography and it's difficult actually for them to make progress in that in that sense. But I will tell you in what direction they're advancing. And then the next is the uh, decided uh, bed for trains in Europe. 
when you are giving your support, um, maybe it's insufficient. I know from our point of view, many of the people who are um, in the green movement currently, either socially or politically, but it's clear that we are betting for trains politically. And it's something that that is consistent, that can be seen, and nobody is actually challenging that. And then there is an important element that green parties need to take into account, which is what appears on the atlas, and uh, it's something that uh, that is really the framework for this uh, talk today. Uh, we, the Harnu Bolstiftung, um, talked about the um, border bottlenecks, um, as a, opposed to the aviation world, which was born thinking internationally. That's why I always explain the same thing. I mean, it's the it's the the most tailor made uh, transportation method. For instance, um, your boarding pass um, in order to go to China from China to Hawaii has the same information than a um, boarding pass that goes from um, Nairobi to to Laos. So. The railway systems, state railway systems, are thought nationally. It's nationwide, not international. So they think about their own geography because there weren't really many cross-border trains. And Daya, for instance, Porvo, is the end of, of our railway system in Spain for the people who are listening to us here today. And in Europe we see, and you should all read the atlas in that chapter, we show that that is the case in Europe. There are states that are not connected because 14 kilometers are missing, 15 kilometers of railway are missing. And this is something that is being considered right now. And it's not being discussed as hotly as we would like, I'm sure, but it is there. And then we also should say that there's the mindset as well. because most of the railway companies are not very competitive there is no competitive there is no competition so the client the the client the consumer is actually captive and we the greens need to have an impact so that that changes because we have demands with regards to quality level um, characteristics and services and we Sp we spanish people when we purchase a Iberia or a vueling um a ticket it's it's cheaper than renta than than trains so that needs to change and that that needs to change because we see differences and the differences are worse so it's not just having infrastructures and having trains but also having affordable prices and also we need to have a quality a, a very a certain quality standard and then there's the impact of the pandemic obviously Many of the meetings, business meetings that we used to do face to face and that involved an important movement of planes and plane transfers, those are going to be lost. We don't know the percentage, but it's clear that that is going to end because you used to have 10 salespeople from company X in Madrid or in Barcelona. Um, well, two of them really wanted to go, but then there were four who were fed up with going everywhere. And then there were two people who didn't want to. And then the company knew that that had a cost. Now that cost can be suppressed, can be eliminated by having a Zoom meeting, a video conference, and that is it. And then it's the impact in the world of tourism. Well, everybody knows that something is going to change, or at least it seems that it's going to change, but no one is really sure how that is going to change and what impact it's going to have. But what I can tell you, due to all the information that is usually shared in the sector, is that plane transfers due to family and, and, and social reasons and tourism are uh, picking up. It's actually something that is picking up. Everyone who has the possibility, the economic possibility, really wants to go and spend their money. And I think that that's good, not because they want to spend. I mean, not just for spending, but because that's that that money is usually going towards socialization, going to the movies, going to restaurants, uh, meeting with friends and so on. So I hope that people now understand the difference between living and surviving and the money that, that is in the banks is going to be kept by the banks. We're not going to take it to the other world if there is another world. 
And then there is sensitivity. Obviously, no one is unaware of the fact that, the, that most people, most of society, understand the impact that flying has, especially environmentally speaking. And people are going to keep on getting aware. It's not going to go down. I don't know how, how many people know this, but now people don't... Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that they frown upon it, but they don't see it as positively as they did 30 years ago, and that's important. And that is already being reflected in the reality. And not just in our thoughts um, and ideas, but also in specific uh, things, for instance. Luckily, uh, the British will have to, ha um, will have to uh, cannot really keep on enlarging Heathrow. And there are no political decisions, radical political decisions in the sense. In Munich, um, a few years ago, there was a referendum with regards to increasing um, their airport with a third landing strip. And they thought it was easy. The airport, the government said that the citizens in Munich also should vote although the airport is 45, 45 kilometers away, and they said no. And the social answer, political answer or response in most political forces to that proposal uh, to have a fourth, uh, a fourth uh, landing strip in El Prat are actually proof and evidence that show that people don't want that. I mean, airports cannot keep on getting bigger. And if airports cannot keep on getting bigger, then aviation will have to to follow that pace. And I think that in general, we are going towards putting aviation in its place. And I will then talk about the reduction of the sector if I have a couple of minutes, but we're going towards what should be our treatment towards any means of transportation. So from the public side, we have to give the best conditions so that people don't have to move. And we are going to raise awareness so that people fly as little as possible, so that they move only the bare minimum. We need to promote meetings and activities such as this one um, online, things that could be done with other means, and that flight should be as efficient as possible as well. If you have to fly, it has to be as efficient as possible. And flying as efficiently as possible from the environmental side is something that uh, follows two lines in Europe. On the one hand, and this has to do with Sweden and Norway and so on, um, uh, flights between islands and flights between the continent and the islands are, would be electrical flights. It seems that in 2030, in 2030, we could already have some commercial electrical uh, flights with fully electric planes. Those would be planes for 200, 300 kilometers. But in many places, that's really the key. I mean, if you look at uh, um, Norway or Italy, or if you look at uh, situations between islands such as Sicily and Malta, with the continent, that is a solution from the environmental standpoint with regards to the flight itself. Obviously, the impact of the airport will be the same. But what we're working on is the... the um, flights in Norway mainly, and then you have everything that has to do with SAF, um, SAF. So the European community is really um, betting on that. They're currently debating a new proposal, which is ref Refuel Europe Aviation, where they're already considering they have already decided not to produce fuel uh, from the agricultural point of view. So it should not be an agricultural production. And they're mainly betting on or investing in... I mean, why have they decided to leave it? Well, because besides figures and calculations and so on, beyond all of that, from the political and social standpoint, this is... This is this is too risky because whether they're right or not, the production of fuel with agricultural material is very easily criticized and it's very easily criticized from a social and political point of view. So the Commission is really now making efforts with regards to waste. So benefiting from waste uh, food waste, for instance, after its uh, incorrect use, 
and waste in general from cities, for instance, and synthetic waste as well. So the person who's, who's managing this, for those of you who know about this, is Flor Diaz Pulido. She's a Spaniard from the Canary Islands. She is the chief of the unit for policy aviation. So all the policies for aviation in the European Union. A very sensible and powerful person who is giving some meaning to this and so that this can actually be done. And if you not only fly less, but you fly more efficiently, well, in the end, there will always be a CO2 emission. So we need to have compensation measures. And compensation measures obviously clashes with a taboo in the sector, a very powerful uh, taboo. And in, in politics, although there have been dozens of applications and lots of uh, work put on it, it's the taboo of taxes on kerosene. You know that it's the only fossil fuel that does not pay taxes and a VAT to plane tickets. I think that from a political standpoint, that is a key element because it's not a distortion. I mean, it has to do with ecological and social justice and market justice. We could even think about market justice when, com when compared to other transportation methods. But on top of that, it's a... Uh, it's something that wouldn't have any impact. Uh, it wouldn't be an unloyal competition because all companies flying in Europe or towards Europe would have to pay that tax. So it really would allow for an increase in the prices of tickets, which could dissuade many people from flying. And and it would be um, some sort of... of forced justice. So that's the general framework. And facing that, there is obviously from a political standpoint, uh, the, the presence of the Greens, um, they're becoming more important. For instance, there's government, government in Austria with Greens present. And in Germany, the government also has Greens. And Europe, you know that it's a club of states. It's not a club of regions or citizens. It should be or it could be a club of citizens and regions. And that is the objective of most of the uh, Green representatives representatives, but the reality is that this is a, a club of states. But the more awareness there is of a state a state level, then there should be should be an echo. And you know that being unanimous is something that blocks many decisions and many of the progress opportunities we have. And the sector, the, uh, the aeronautic and airport sector, in, be in the best case scenario, is understanding that there is no exit for them. That's in the best case scenario. And in all families, obviously, there are people who understand things earlier than others for many different reasons. And it's a very strong sector, very powerful sector, very well, um, very well, in very well um, embedded in Brussels and in all European states, and they're uh, currently greenwashing everything. There are lots of initiatives in the sector because they've realised that they have to go towards it, although they don't like it. But they want to control the pace. They want to control the steps to be taken. They want to be the ones to set their own targets. They want to be the ones to set their own achievements and the way in which they can provide um, economic support if needed in that sense. And they always use the lever of, well, aviation is an international world and and... And it was created even before the Second World War to manage um, air transportation. We have to follow what IATA says and we have to follow this and that. And, and the carriers in the mid... Um, in, the, in, in the Middle East, they have free kerosene and so on. And it's true that there are informations and there are things that do make sense and they're consistent but they use it in a very biased way 
um, for instance, the polemic uh, that was published three weeks ago about Lufthansa saying, please, 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 we have uh, we have empty flights. Could you please allow us to reduce the number of flights that we have to do in every, in every slot? You know, the slot is the time that the uh, carrier has to land and to get their passengers out of the plane and then get the new passengers and fly again. So it's not the same thing at half past seven uh, to go to Brussels than at 11 in the morning. So Lufthansa does have no environmental interest whatsoever. What they wanted was to obviously, instead of flying 80% of the times, I can fly 50% of the time, then I'm saving money, but I will maintain those lots because I got them because I'm one of the biggest carriers, one of the oldest and one of the most powerful ones. So... So that's the thing. So I think that um, like everything in Brussels, Brussels is simply um, the loudspeaker where we hear what is already happening in European societies. So what happens in European societies and European parliaments can then be heard in Brussels. So the more we push um, as a society, in our states, in our countries, through the different means that we all have, all citizens have, the more we will make progress. And and I'll finish with this, and this image of aviation, um, so that it is for what it needs to be and in an efficient way. And when we fly, we have to compensate. And then something that passengers do voluntarily, because you never know where those four or six or 50 um, 50 euros you give to British or Lufthansa or Iberia so that they can compensate. The more we push their buttons, the more we will be closer to that final landscape that where we will have this uh, future that I have introduced to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sergi, for these insights on the aviation world in Europe. I We already have a few questions regarding all of this, but before I give, them, I give the floor to the questions, I would like to continue with our next speaker. And he is a person, and as a person who has taken a plane and who has compensated her ticket, I would like to know where my compensation is going. And on the other hand, I also have taken the plane in El Prat, in the airport of El Prat, and there weren't many people in the airport. And this, I'm sure, also has an impact in the uh, situation in the city, I'm sure it has an impact in the city um, where El Prat is. And we have here today the pleasure of having Joan Herrera here with us. He is the director for the area of environment in the airport of El Prat. And he is going to tell us about the conversation on the uh, extension of the airport um, where there aren't many people. I have seen, as uh, Sergi has explained, in Europa. In Europe, we have reached our maximum. And this maybe is a conversation. Um, and what is the impact in a city such as El Prat, which leaves around the, the airport, uh, around and with the airport? So, Joanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, and congratulations. I would like to, congr to congratulate the GEF, uh, Transición Verde and Nos Horizons for this day and for opening up the, the conversation about this energy transition that will not be possible if there isn't a change in mobility. You have asked me to talk about an experience, a bad experience, although it was successful in the end and talk about the fight that we at the City Council of El Prat have been having with regards to the airport extension. There are some previous elements that I wanted to give you for context. Uh, we, we are not, our agenda is not visible in the south of Europe because I think that when there is something that is considered in the center of Europe with regards to improving mobility um, and going from air transportation to railway, we mustn't forget that in the south of Europe, uh, which is an economy of services with great dependence on tourism, there will be a great pressure to maintain 
these flights, these cheap flights that will allow for many tourists to keep on coming to the south of Europe. And these restrictions will be different because obviously distances between the south of Europe and, and central Europe are, are different, they're higher. So it's not an agenda that will be easy to push. And I think that the result of this agenda was this debate, this debate of the airport extension, a proposal from the 20th century, not even the end of the 20th century. It was a proposal that was done in the 80s, at the beginning of the 90s, in a context of Green New Deal, where they were talking about the next generation and where they were telling us that resilience after the COVID crisis needed to be green. Well, the Catalan society and much of the Spanish society has been spinning around a proposal of the airport extension, an airport, uh, El Prat, which um, reached 54 million passengers pre-COVID, an airport that had grown a lot I mean, the, during the last decade, an airport that was not interconnected with other close airports, such as the airport of Reus or the airport of Girona, which are airports that are only half an hour away from rail um, with small investments. And it was the only alternative. So I'm not going to to talk about what Sergi has been mentioning because he's very knowledgeable with regards to everything he said but we all know where we need to be headed but but during these last few minutes we could have a big infrastructures that will be obsolete but that will have a great impact in the territory and in this context we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic with an airport that that doesn't even reach 20 million passengers nowadays with a proposal for the extension of the airport with the argument and the need for this airport to be um, an airport that is a world reference. It needs to be a continental, an intercontinental hub and that could grow over 70 million passengers per year. The argument was that uh, an interconnected airport gave more opportunities to the, the, to the Mediterranean area, connected companies better, attracted big investments and would make lots of multinationals decide to settle here. It's an argument that is not very solid because we have experiences, uh, diverse experiences all over Europe where cities that are very successful uh, don't come in hand in hand with big airports. And uh, an argument actually actually, that didn't really take into account the impact, the extraordinary impact that tourism has, especially low-cost uh, tourism in the growth model of the city of Barcelona and all of its um, geographical area. As Suzanne was saying, we are not a city council that lives uh, um, looking away from the airport. Much of the, the city is within the airport and it is part of one of the, the main economic activities that we have in our municipality. But it's also true that as a municipality we understood that we reached the consensus, a consensus of uh, with regards to the extension of the airport and growth of the infrastructures at uh, the beginning of the year 2000s, an extension of the port as well, the harbour, with um with the river and also with a combination between two main um emitting centers and then protected spaces such as the delta of the Llobregat, which has a high environmental impact which is the main reservoir for biodiversity in this in the metropolitan area so what was our argument our argument was that the proposal did not fulfill the requirements you know that in order to work in a protected area such as the protected spaces the proposal needed to really show that that which was being affected could be replaced. They needed to also show that there were no alternatives, that we could only have this option of extending the airport. And they also needed to prove that this protected general interest so that we could have that extension. So we have INS proposal that wanted for an extension of the uh, landing strip uh, Mar, 500 more meters, an extension that would allow to um, reach over 70 million passengers, that would allow landing flights coming from other continents 
and mainly the takeoff of, um, of these flights because there are more technical difficulties in difficulties and there would be varied environmental compensation such as the creation of lagoons not um, and what did we do from the city council of El Prat well first of all we needed to put it in context we explained that this extension would take place after a warning by the European Commission to the Kingdom of Spain and the government of Spain and also the government of the Generalitat because the compensations derived from the enlargement of the harbour and the airport 20 years ago did not fulfill the environmental function actually the Llobregat Delta and that has been seen by the European Commission has seen a reduction in species, a reduction in biodiversity of 60%, up to 60%. So what we found ourselves with was that um, that unexpected situation where they asked for an extension of the airport, although the environmental compensations had not fulfilled their objectives, and in some cases they simply had not been developed. And this is where what we did was uh, draft a report that we sent to the minister for the for the uh, ecological transition to the commissioner and to the um, the regional ministry minister where we highlighted the um clear unfulfillments or the breaches in in this by the different authorities a loss of quality in the bodies of water the inexistence of a biological corridor that would that would connect the bodies of water aena had talked about a compensation that they should have paid 20 years ago and the degradation of uh, bodies of water, for instance, the superficial aquifers, but a series of elements that made it impossible to accept this extension of the airport. And then there is um, a reasoning which explains the uh, the fact that that of the recarga, the recarga cannot be substituted. It's a lagoon that connects the sea, and it's actually when you land, when you land it at El Prat. It has a high environmental value, it has biodiversity values that cannot be substituted, cannot be replaced and cannot be compensated with the creation of a different lagoon at the other side of the protected spaces in an agricultural area that is not connected to the sea. So that is why we explain that this replacement, this substitution could not take place. The second chapter that we tackled was the fact that it's not replaceable and there are alternatives. AENA could not have continued with this proposal because we understood, first of all, that there were alternatives in the improvement of the landing stripes improvement. They said that they needed 500 meters to allow for the takeoff of planes, intercontinental flights uh, takeoff. But the truth is that the current landing stripes in El Prat, in their um, takeoff processes, they have spaces between planes that are that are larger than what we would currently need in Heathrow. In El Prat, there isn't a policy of um, getting valley points or peaks into valleys. So you know that we have peak moments and valley moments, but in Heathrow, they do manage that because they have their own policy for the management of this. So what we did was put on the table the existence of all the alternatives, which is something that the GEF is working on, which is the need for a Catalan strategy to guarantee, as we have in many uh, countries, a better uh, connection between Reus, Girona and Barcelona that would allow for, um, for planes not to have to take off and, and land in El Prat. And some of them could maybe take off and land in Reus and Girona. But beyond that element, which would maintain aviation, what we did put on the table was a proposal that we that we drafted to guarantee the improvement of railway connections, the Mediterranean corridor with the south of uh, France, first of all, guaranteeing an area where... We wouldn't have to fly. I mean, those um, those flights that are less than 500 meters, he said, I think he meant 500 kilometers with the whole Ebro corridor, Bilbao, Basque Country and uh, Cantabria. We also talked about the improvement of uh, railway connections with those cities, which currently are in, in the south of Europe, in the north of Italy, that would allow for railway connections that would improve, substantially uh, improve the... Um, 
the the movements in train and that we would also include night trains as we are considering considering right now in order to go from Copenhagen to London. That is an element that we also included with much force. And this report that we, the platform uh, for, um, for the public transportation, just came to prove that there are alternatives. So we could put on the table an improvement of the landing and takeoff for flights. And we also had the possibility of putting on the table the improvements that needed to be made. It was paradoxical because if you look at it, what we were putting on the table was a million uh, dollar investment by AENA, but the improvements that we thought needed to be done for uh, railway connections, intermodal connections, such as the one in El Prat, that would allow for the connection between airports through railway um, in our influence area by decreasing times of transfer between airport and, and railway. The new railway stations in Girona and Reus that would allow not so much um, a transfer for a passenger from Reus and Girona and El Prat, but rather having certain flights that land in Barcelona could land in Girona and the passenger could then take a, a train to Barcelona or stay in Costa Dorada. Well, those investments were much, much smaller than the 2.5 billion that Aena was considering. It was around 200 million, with around 200 million euros. We were improving the railway infrastructure and we would be... Um, allowing for a decarbonization. And the third block that we considered was the defense of the general interest. And I think that here we need to really highlight general interest, which is not the same we had 20 years ago. We currently have to understand that we have a climate emergency. The El Prat City Council has declared the climate emergency as well as Barcelona and the Generalitat and the Spanish state has declared it as well. But what's paradoxical about this is that although we have declared this climate emergency and although there is the law for climate emergency, we still act as though as though nothing has changed. They wanted to operate in infrastructures that they did in the past. So we need to understand that the general interest has changed. It's not an abstract legal concept. It's something very concrete and that has to be defined depending on the circumstances. In a scenario of climate emergency, you cannot uh, think that uh, the the objective is to enlarge infrastructures that make us more dependent from fossil fuel and that keep on emitting. So we understood that with these three arguments and the fact that uh, the affected areas cannot be replaced, the existence of alternatives and the improvement of railway connections and a general interest that has changed, what we could not is allow for an airport extension. What's surprising and look at it. Um, actually, the debate in Catalonia, the debate in, in Spain, uh, spent around a proposal which was the extension of the airport, an old-fashioned proposal that was um, greenhouse gases emitting and that would increase our energy dependency um, of, well, the dependence of our economy and our productive model. So they didn't want Barcelona to be a city of reference, um, um, with R and D and I, but rather they wanted to uh, to have all of the Barcelona economy turn into a services economy, something that gives less value, um, less added value. And I think that that's where we need to fight, and this is a cultural fight, really. This is where we have to change, and I will end as I started. In this post-pandemic scenario, we thought that the green and environmental transition was different. Even now, when we talk about next generation, we are thinking that this green and ecological transition is obvious, it's evident, but it could happen that during this transition, with this energy and environmental transition, that has its costs, obviously, and some um, some sectors that are impacted. We always find the the middle road. Well, Sergei was saying it. The aero the aerospace uh, sector knows what its its uh, final will be, but they're offering proposals that are even crazy, such as the proposal of the the El Prat Airport extension that came hand in hand with 
with a proposal for the extension of the Barajas airport, which was approved. I think that it is fundamental here that we are capable of making decarbonization proposals by giving efficient, effective, real alternatives for the transportation of passengers and for the transportation of freight as well. I think that with freight transportation, air transportation is, is not going to be an alternative. It's very difficult for it to be an alternative due to the high cost and and actually the containers coming from Asia could be an, an, a factor for the relocalization of some industrial cities that were in Asia and that now could come back to Europe. But with regards to passengers' transportation, what we need to consider is a scenario of alternative improving railways connections. And I will finish as I started. It will not be an obvious agenda because our economy is an economy that even today, even in a post-pandemic uh, situation, is, very, is highly dependent from tourism and services. Um, a tourist sector with low costs that has to maintain cheap planes for tourists to reach here at a low price. So we cannot talk about aviation and about the um, air sector without thinking about trains, without thinking about trains to transport many people and without thinking about the reconversion of the touristic sector and the operation of new vectors that had to do with green and energy transition. Things go actually hand in hand because if not what we'll find in two, three, four years will be a new offensive. We have been working very well, I think, on our alternatives and the irreplaceable characteristic of the reguarda and the environmental conditions that need to be considered. So what are we doing now? Well, currently we are defining an inf a green infrastructure space. The El Prat airport is in the Delta of Llobregat just beside the harbor of Barcelona. And, and it is the main green infrastructure of the metropolitan area. It's a green infrastructure because as any wet area, it is the main reservoir of biodiversity, although it's not being recognized as such. These are protected species that have a ridiculous budget for their management. The Generalitat only gives 280,000 euros for their management. It's ridiculous. And then we have the main area for agricultural production of the metropolitan area as well. So we're talking about um, zero kilometer production. So we need to change our mindset and we need to understand what is fundamental in highly dense metropolitan areas. We need to have green infrastructures that add value or to um, that add value. It's not just about how a plane lands and takes off or how a um, boat or a ship gets here and unloads its freight, but rather how we uh, protect our biodiversity, how we feed our city with um, proximity products. So we need to have an ecologist uh, mindset. It is important to include in our agenda, in our uh, infrastructure development agenda, the the idea of caring for our people, feeding our people, managing our green infrastructure that provides us values that are irreplaceable, such as biodiversity or uh, food sovereignty. So lastly, I wanted to say that in the City Council website, you will find all the uh, reports that we have drafted and sent to the different authorities. And we also have a report on the alternatives with regards to the functioning of the port and alternatives with regards to railway infrastructures, the irreplaceable characteristic of the regarda and water bodies, what happened with aquifers, and also a report with regards to how compensations have failed, um, environmental compensations have failed, and which environmental compensations have not been fulfilled. This has allowed us to better explain that the alternative is not about extending the airport, but what's obvious is that we have to fight the airport extension with arguments such as, yes, let's increase the um, railway infrastructure. Yes, let's better manage our green infrastructures that are as important as those gray infrastructures that are 
that are currently present in all of our realities. Suzanne, I tried to respect the time. It wasn't 10 minutes, but I have tried to, to respect the time that was given to me. Thank you so much. Don't worry, Joanne. I think that it was very interesting, this part of listening, listening to what the City Council has done to reach this point. But I also have to say that we need to know what we will have in the future. I think that it's important to know this. I will now give the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Sergi, once again. Thank you for giving us that, that uh, overview of the situation. We have a few minutes for your questions because you have a few questions. And Raul has already been noting some questions on the chat. So I will give him the floor and maybe... Uh, both speakers could could turn their uh, cameras on to see who can answer the questions and who can make comments regarding um, the different comments. Thank you, Susanne. Well, yes, there have been a few questions and there have been some interesting comments as well. Before I ask the questions to the to the speakers, Sergio and Joan. Josep Yuis, who needed to leave, asked how we could access the recording of the session. So I would like to tell all of you who are connected that when these, these uh, days are finished, uh, when all of these different sessions are finished, we will send you a link with, um, with the different recorded sessions. And if you have not... Um, asked for more information from the Foundation Transición Verde, that will be the time to do so, so that we can send the link. So the first question was asked by Ruben, who is a pilot, and he was saying, Sergi, uh, that there is the Refuel EU, EU Directive, and he was asking, I'm actually telling you because you talked about this during your presentation, he was asking whether you have or we have an idea of when more or less this directive could be approved. Well, Thank you, thank you, Raúl, and and I am very happy to know that there is a pilot on this forum. It's actually very positive. That means that, as always, I mean, it's good to see it live. We we mustn't think that we're always talking to the same people. We might, mustn't be prejudiced. So, Ruben, the idea is, with regards to this topic. A few days before Christmas, I had the pleasure of meeting with Flor, and her idea is to approve it before the summer. That's her idea, but obviously you know that these decisions um, are the following. The Commission makes a proposal that goes through the Parliament, then there needs to be an agreement between the Commission, the Parliament and the different states. And that's where we find ourselves. I don't know if you read last week that there was um, some information published at El Economista where they said that um, El Europa no, no, were against. They were against this proposal. And this is in line with what I was saying previously, that the sector um, obviously wants, and it's, it's obvious, they want to set their own pace and their own initiatives and so on. So let's see. We have here, in all these cases and in the next six months, The Presidency of Europe will be held by France. France is the one presiding over the EU. And this week there will be something called the Toulouse Declaration. And, Toulouse, and France is working uh, together with the states with some of the stakeholders on this declaration. And it's actually good, but it's insufficient. It is not sufficiently ambitious. Um, it needs to advance faster towards sustainability. There was another question on the chat saying, what else can we do to make progress in this topic? Well, I would like to tell uh, you who are here in Spain that during the second semester, Spain will be the uh, will hold the presidency, and the presidency is not just anything. We will once again be in a difficult situation. It will be a special situation, just like with France. So at the end of 2023, we will have state elections. We will have general elections in Spain. So I think that those of us who are aware and who 
are, are completely dedicated dedicated to this we could push so that spain really speaks its mind and does something and we have a few months ahead to work so the idea for the commission wants to approve it before summer so flor said i want to go on holidays having closed this that's the idea let's see if it's possible thank you sergi there was also a comment by pedro javier diaz alejo he talks about two ideas two concepts that need to be included with regards to the reduction of uh, the use of uh, planes. There's the flick scan. For those of you who don't know it, this is something that was coined in Sweden. It is, it was like the re rejecting or rejecting flying whenever there is an alternative, and need, and it's something that the citizen does as a personal initiative, and then taxes to fuel something that Sergio already said during his presentation such as uh, taxes to kerosene, which is um, something that is absolutely logical. It's it's anomalous not to have this. And I wanted to highlight the flick scan because there is a cultural matter here, which I think has not been talked about enough during your presentations, which is fundamental as well to change our mindset. This um, this is something that Joan said. Joan, I remember, sorry if I, if I get lost in my explanations for a bit, but he... He talked about the model of society that certain influencers are currently projecting. Remember Cristiano Ronaldo when he was playing in Madrid? One day it was said that he had gone to Turin to, for dinner and then he came back after dinner. This is something that a young, uh, a young person who's dreaming of being a footballer would want to do as well. I want to catch a plane, go to Turin for dinner and then come back to Madrid and that's it. And that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Well, this is something that society is projecting and has an impact in our culture and and in our conscience as well. And this is something that we have talked to you, this uh, tourism of selfies. You know, you fly, you take a few selfies and you go back. You don't really visit places. You just take pictures and that's it. And you go back to your your country of origin, this, this culture of immediacy. And this is thanks or... Um, thanks to Amazon maybe. So this should be in this debate, but we don't have the time to tackle all of these things. But I would really want to to, to ask two questions to Joan, two questions in one. Uh, Juan was saying, one of the keys wouldn't be social mobilization to force a political decision. And Sandra was adding the specific case of the El Prat uh, airport. Do you think that the stakeholders and pressure groups will talk about the airport extension again? What will be the measures that we need to take? And do you think that Europe could have a role here? So I'm asking you this, John, because you were talking about the fact that the airport felt very lonely in its fight against the extension. Okay, so before before I answer this question, I I have to say that saying this in a different world, this is about individual commitment or a mass option, and this is my opinion. I think that if there is n if there is no control with regards to fuel we will it will only be a decision of minorities so we don't have the tools the cultural tools i mean to be able to fight a uh, weekend in malta for 50 years if you're um, a neighbor of the metropolitan area and you can fly to Valletta for 50 years, you probably will go to La Valletta. Some people might not do it, but um, people will keep on going to La Valletta just as they will keep on going to Barcelona. And what's the problem we have? Well, our economy does not depend on people going to Valletta. They depend on many Englishmen and German citizens or French citizens will come to Barcelona for 50 years. So we cannot limit the debate of mobility um, without linking it to the economic debate because we will not be able to win that debate if we, if we don't link them and we need to do it by providing alternatives. Because the working class only has alternatives um, in the metropolitan area with these services. So how can you do it? So we need a, a proposal that will control the fuel that is linked to ecologic transition, just transition with alternatives. And without a strong proposal in that sense, it is difficult to win this battle.
Secondly, the scenario. Are they going to go back at it? Well, I think it depends on different elements. I I think that it's more the air, air, aeroportuary city. It had a low cost because what they were thinking of was really um, having... Well, the satellite, the satellite might be needed in the future. That's what the experts say. But actually, the the cost of uh, extending the landing strip was was ridiculous. I mean, in economic in economic cost, it was around two hundred million euros. It wasn't a lot. But right now, extending um, an extension of the airport would be limitless. It would, would grow up to a hundred million passengers, and it was actually very important for us in, in trying to make the city grow as an airport and a harbor will it come back i don't know it depends it depends on the one hand of the evolution of the air traffic Aena had its forecasts the recovery of air traffic that was like the pre-pandemic situation and in el prat we would be around 70 million passengers and in 2027 this is what i remember i don't have the figures before me this is what i remember but I, it depends because this traffic, this air traffic, is linked in Barcelona, that this is very important, is linked to elements such as fares. Um, and the big companies, are they going to keep on traveling as they did previously? Or are only going to the top directives come to the fares? Will there be a change in habits? Because there are reports that you have that show that there is a change. 2%, I think, of of users, of plane users, concentrate a very high number of, of transfers, plane transfers. And those are top executives. Many of them are going to stop going for meetings. We all have seen that many meetings that we used to do pre-pandemic uh, where we needed to take the, the plane or the train, we would go to, to Madrid or to Barcelona that were uh, done with a high-speed train. Now they have become, become video conferences. So what's going to be the impact of all of this? And secondly, where there'll be a change in touristic behaviors, discovering that which is closer by, are we going to travel less? Or when we travel, are we going to travel for a longer time, having other alternatives? Or are we going to travel less? That's the first element to know if this uh, topic has been closed or not. We need first to know what happens what happens with regards to air transportation linked to fares, for instance, and big conferences. And that's a very important percentage because that is what guarantees that air, air traffic, high air traffic outside of the summer summer time. And then also a change in our touristic behaviors. And the second element, which I believe um, determines the situation, is the need to to give value, environmental value to protected um, spaces because there is this perception that in El Prat what we have is a port and a harbor, um, an airport and a harbor, sorry. But now that has changed a bit thanks to the debate with regards to the airport extension. But people are still not aware of the importance, the ecological importance of this area. So will the Catalan authorities be able to highlight the value of what they have? Because up till now, they have not been able to do it. I mean... Uh, the, the city councils and the city council of El Prat have been very proactive it, and the merit is not mine, it's the merit of those who were there before me, Sergi, for instance, who was one of the city, um, one of the councillors of the city council in El Prat. They really highlighted the environmental value of El Prat. That is why we had a miracle here because any other city council would maybe have wiped everything out. Will we be capable of highlighting the value of what we have? If we do, I don't think they will open this file again. So so all of this is very important with regards to the airport extension. We need to have a clear warning because these warnings that the Commission, the European Commission, has sent to the Kingdom of Spain for the degradation of protected spe uh, spaces, what are the authorities going to do? AENA is also to compensate where they haven't done it because they have had an irregular behavior in protected spaces and environmental compensations that they have not fulfilled because they were built over premises that have not been respected. That is the other determining element. So I would say 
Uh, is this a closed file? Well, it depends. It depends on the evolution of the behaviors, touristic behaviors. We have to build an alternative, as I said. Secondly, depending on whether we highlight the value of protected uh, spaces in the area and depending on how we deal with that warning sent by the Commission, which I believe is, is what requires mobilization. But there needs to be conviction by the Kingdom of Spain that the proposal was um, going to be closed by the Commission. That is why, in the end, they uh, they consider that the battle was lost because we could have found a situation where the Kingdom of Spain said, I'll approve this plan and I will invest in the extension of the airport. And in a year time or two, year time, uh, two years uh, time, the Commission might have said, no, 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 you can't because you have a warning because you did not fulfill the compensations from 20 years ago. So... That was really important. It was a very powerful lever when uh, they decided to stop fighting for the airport extension. But it depends really, Raul, from, from these factors. And also, it depends on the, um, the skills of the Catalan authorities and knowing how to highlight the value of all of these green infrastructures that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another question um, written by Christoph that has to do with railway services, for instance, the difficulty to purchase a ticket from Spain to Germany. So I'll remind you that next Tuesday we will have a session on um, bicycles and then on the 15th we will have one on railways and we will have a Tilimets, our, our MP, a European MP who's in the um, Tourism Commission who might be able to give us more information and shed some light on this. Susanne, I think that the questions have been answered. Would you like to ask one last question to our speakers or? I'm going to ask one last question so that we can close this session in a different way. So this topic has been the, the this topic has been very interesting. It was a plane and the next days we will be talking about bicycles and about trains. You too. What is the mean of transportation that you use most? In your day to day, or in your uh, the time that you spend working, I mean, what is the mean of transportation that you, that you use the most? Okay, I'll answer. Maybe because Alegre uh, comes before Herrera. I think. Well, I could answer your question. I think that some people know what I'm going to answer. I use the plane because I move around Europe and if every time I ha every have uh, I don't have a, a car and every ha time I have to move around if I were to take a plane I wouldn't be home ever I don't spend much time at home but I would never be home but I don't think that's a question I think that and Juan was saying it and I really like the way he said it it's about are we talking about each and every one of us or are we talking about trends? And I had the honor and the pleasure for a few years uh, to work for El Prat as a, a council, as a counselor. And they would say, they're taking their kids to this or that school. Well, they, obviously there needs to be consistency between what you do and what you say, but you're there because of the decisions, the political decisions that you uh, that you make, because citizens have uh, decided to vote for you and trust in you, not so much in you, but rather that you will have a certain specific political program and um, a proposal of actions, of work, or of whatever it is. And I think it's what John was saying. It's not about what each and every one of us does or rather planting seeds, proposing, directing, managing, legislating in the case of parliament, in the case, not in the case of city councils and territorial governments because they don't have that capacity, they cannot legislate. But I think that in general, we have to try and, and show what the reflection is and what 
and and to set the conditions so that people can can reflect on certain things what they need to do for instance if i'm here today if i'm at el prat of Llobregat, if i have to go to a corner of my city uh, where I was born 58 years ago, I'm going to either walk or take the bike or take the car. What am going? What am I going to do? That's what I have to do. If I'm going to purchase uh, groceries, will it be artichokes from El Prat or from Argentina? Obviously, I love Argentina, but what I'm going to do? So, and then it needs to be made easy. For instance, if I want to to purchase. Um, glass wa glass water bottles so that I don't use plastic but there are no glass bottles uh, then I can't do it why have they why have they taken that out of the market well because there were no laws such as we have in other countries in Spain we don't have those laws that would set the conditions for supermarkets to be forced to offer that product. So that is the option. So I think that's where we need to work. We at the foundations and at the movement, the ecological movement, eco-socialist movement, we have to work on raising awareness so that then the political forces can put that into practice. Slowlier or faster, depending on the political relationships and the votes and the data, but we need to set the trends because there will always be a minority that doesn't want to get vaccinated, for instance. Okay, okay, let's not talk about vaccines now. Okay, thank you. I didn't know, Sergi, that you're the one who takes more planes. I know that Joan is going to answer differently, I know, and it's it's what you said. I mean, it depends on how where you are, but you said that your plane... Well, I, I, I've always used a bike in my life and I am actually asking for um, a bike lane in my city so that I can go to El Prat on bike. But it doesn't exist. That bike lane does not exist. We don't have that connection. When I worked in Madrid, my transportation mean was a train in order to go to Madrid from Barcelona. But before there was a train... Years before, when I was an MP during the first legislature, I would take the plane because I couldn't go to Madrid any other way. And right now it's public transportation or my electric bike with a uh, battery that I can extract and charge with renewable energy that we use here at home. So it's a combination really. But I'm going to finish with this, Suzanne, what Sergio was saying. We have to have alternatives. We, the alternative for Sergi is a night train that could connect Brussels and Barcelona, for instance, with not um, without a big investment, and that would allow for a, a consumer of planes start consuming um, night trains. If in my case, now it's actually very simple. It's as simple thing as that. It's as simple as that. If we had a bike lane in Monroe that enters the harbor, it's only two hundred meters, three hundred meters, not not more than that. Just a connection in bike lane. I could move from from Poblenou, which is on the coast of Barcelona, and I I've I've done it through my whole life. I've always used my bike, and actually I would uh, I would I would shed some kilos that I have that I now have because I'm not taking my bike as often as I did previously. So I think that obviously there is an individual component. It's our commitment, obviously. But at the same time, as Sergio was saying, there is an increase. Um, there is an increasing need for new policies, infrastructures, new fuels. I mean, a little uh, bike lane is an infrastructure that connects metropolitan areas, but also the improvement of railways that would allow for night trains because the night train is going to be a reality in the center of Europe. But the thing is that uh, those of us who are in the periphery of Europe, how can we guarantee night trains that would allow us to take the train in Brussels and wake up in Barcelona the next day. I mean, we don't need a great investment, but we do need a public policy by European um, European politics so that that becomes a reality. Well, thank you so much for your answers. I knew that we were going to talk about plane and bike, but that's exactly what I wanted to say because the answer is not easy, is it? It's not saying, well... 
this is the way to move around and this is what we all need to do because also with the night train which i also hope we will have in 2024 that will take us all the way to barcelona it doesn't uh, reduce all the planes that we currently have in barcelona and the green european foundation has the European focus now. The European focus or perspective means that we need to have a change and connection and we need to talk amongst us, amongst us Europeans, so that we become stronger, greener, more sustainable and also more intercultural and more open to debate such as the one that we hosted here today. And I hope that with these with these days that we are going to start um, hosting, these seminars we're going to start uh, hosting, we will now inform you about other things that move us all, because mobility is something basic, something basic nowadays due to work, but also due to um, our new needs in our private life. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for your collaboration. Thank you for the collaboration between the Green European Foundation, Transición Verde and No Horizons. Thank you so much to the two of you, our speakers, um, Sergio Alegre and Joan Herrera. And I hope to see you next week so that we may talk about bicycles. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all very much. Thank you.